My name's Joe. I'm a marine biologist. I worked at the formerly at Underwater World in Guam and at the Curacao Sea Aquarium. Uh, before that, I was at UNCW working on coral physiology and uh, calcification research. So while my tech is trying to catch up with me, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about coral biology, reproduction, and efforts going on right now for sustainable reef re restoration. Yes, yes. Go, go computer. Uh, so, um, the reason that we're talking about this, one, this is a huge area for uh, reef keeping. We have a lot of marine science uh, education stuff going on in North Carolina. I don't know, it's not even connecting to the router. Oh my god. Okay, yeah. I, oh, no worries. You have fun with that. Anyways, <laughs> so. What I'm gonna do instead, if I can find one of the videos from a big one from my one of the night dives. Da, da, da. All right. One of the few things that I do have loaded on my computer is from a spawning dive in Guam. And can I move this like that way a little bit? Do, 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 do. So when the coral spawning is going on, they're not the only thing spawning. It's actually a coordinated mass spawning event between lots of different species. But the corals are the ones that we're primarily concerned with. But what you see here are all different kinds of zooplankton I've got together in a light trap. Um, when, the, when a lot of these organisms spawn, especially those that are hermaphroditic, so that have separate male and female sexes, the females will release the egg bundle packets first, which are buoyant, they float up to the surface. Uh, the males will then release the sperm off of a chemical cube, and it all kind of mixes in a big soup. But while that's going on, you have all different other species that are doing the same thing. There'll be sea urchins breeding, sea stars, uh, all different kinds of worms, which is actually what you saw in the beginning of the video. If you watch around my light source, a lot of these things are what's called positively phototaxic, so they're attracted to light, and they will aggregate either near the surface, which will be the moonlight, or in the nearest, brightest light source, which is usually the flashlight that you're holding. So, another one. And hopefully one of these guys has got one of the tents that we actually use to capture the larvae. Because I don't like being covered in worms while I'm doing my spawning dives, which are almost always at night, unless you're diving somewhere between uh, 90 to 120 feet. Deeper corals spawn earlier in the day, whereas most of the reef building species that we think of, acroporas, uh, your plating corals, things that you would see in the Caribbean, like Marcatus or Macellas, they all spawn early in the morning between 7 p.m. and about 11 p.m. The interesting thing is that different species will spawn at different times. So you will have almost a, a segregation of time slots in which different species spawn so that their effort is then more concentrated and thus more effective. One of the things that you see with this is, again, like with the coordinated spawning, is with the different species restricting the breakups in it, we can map out patterns uh, in you know, how healthy certain species certain corals are doing versus others because you can actually see the different species spawning different volumes at different times. Uh, we use that as a really good rough rubric to keep track of how healthy different patches are. So what you're seeing in this video is then all of these other organisms that are spawning at the same time. I gotta learn how to use this thing back. So what these worms actually are, they're called epitopes. It's a reproductive section of the worm. The head of the worm is actually still living in the bottom where it's perfectly safe, can't be eaten by predatory reef fish. Um, one of the ways that we know that the corals are about to spawn is that you hear it. It sounds like the reef itself becomes alive. And it's not just all of these different kinds of things. It's all of the reef fish, things like butterfly fish, angels, uh, all different kinds of snappers, groupers, little 
fashions, everything comes up off the bottom and starts feeding. Uh, a lot of times when we use the track, where we know, uh, for example, like a, uh, a broadcast bar or something that releases big clumps of egg packets, is you follow the butterfly fish. They'll actually move around from colony to colony as they spawn because they can smell the chemical cue of the coral release. Hello. Fantastic. So now you're going to hear me loud and in surround sound. Um, I don't know how good that is for everybody, but. All right, because this is annoying me, I'm going to switch up. I think I've got a copy of it saved, my presentation saved here. And it's not as good as the one that I actually prepared that I'm not getting access to. I promise I'm actually better at coral restoration than I am at tech presentation. Presentation mode. Enter slide share. Horrendous. I hate you, computer. It's like it's trying to make me look bad. Uh, I usually do a pretty good job on my own, so I'm actually, you know, I'm kind of taking the computer because I really don't need help in screwing this up. All right, and now it's locking up on me. Sweet. Thank you, technology. Alright, so, one of the main things that I wanted to talk about, because that's why I was talking about coral spawning, is CCOR. It's an international program, it's, it's interesting to us because it's made up mostly of zoos and aquariums. Uh, the Florida and Georgia Aquarium, uh, Shedd Aquarium, California, Steinhardt Aquarium, uh, was it Rotterdam Zoo and Aquarium, Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. A lot of different facilities are associated with this program. And what we're doing is we're going out and this is old, there's like eight more sites now that they're using. We're working specifically with the Rock Rock Armada. That was the main focus of the entire project. So looking at how to restore these coral because they made up a huge chunk of the shallow reef throughout the majority of the Caribbean. And over 90 to 95% have been lost in the last 50 to 30 years due to diff all sorts of different kinds of factors. But Talk about fun stuff today. I get to do it and do it blue. Um, so, I work sometimes with Brian with Noah. But at this point, the whole operation has expanded. It started out with about two dozen people that eventually wanted to make something more happen in coral restoration. Uh, the head guy is Dirk Peterson, one of the head guys. He did his PhD at the University of Amsterdam on coral settlement. Uh, and he was able to spawn and settle corals in captivity. Um, and that sort of led me to okay, if we can do this once in a lab, why can't we do it more in different places, especially in the field, and really step up the abil our ability to restore threatened reefs? The idea now it's grown from just to do this to back a million corals a year. Uh, this is part of the building process. I guess I should probably talk into this microphone. This is going to be neat. All right. Can I do both at once? Can y'all all hear me just anyways? Screw it up. Why? It's making my life more complicated. So, project location. This is where I was for the last, uh, well, five years before I moved to Guam. Uh, they set up shop in Curacao mainly because it's out of the hurricane belt, so it doesn't do you a lot of good to set up a restoration facility that gets smashed every two years. So Curacao is out of the hurricane belt, but also due to the bathymetry, there's a very stable water temperature. One of the problems you run into with corals is that they like to grow in nice, shallow, clear water. Areas like the Florida Keys, you have hundreds of square miles where the water is no deeper than 20 or 30 feet. 
During the summer when the wind stops blowing, this can heat up really hot, 95 degrees or more, which is very stressful, all other factors considered. Curacao mainly has a max water temperature of about 83, 84 degrees, which is the normal maximum in happy temperature uh, for the majority of green yellow and yellow species. Now, as you go deeper and your species have birds and you have those that are adapted to live as you go with less light, they're also a little less tolerant of temperature change and they usually reside in slightly cooler water. Uh, 77, 78 degrees, depending on where you are. So, we're located on the south side of the island. The advantage for this is that there's almost no industrial development. All of the industrial development on the island is located here around Williamstad and here where there's a bull and buy, which is actually a crude oil terminal going, refined gasoline products going out. Uh, but the way the island's shaped, the prevailing current direction moves eastward along the island, splits at the end, and the island stays very well flush because the water drops off very quickly. If you're standing on shore in Curacao and you're looking out at the wall behind you, it's already 20 to 30 feet deep in places. Uh, if you're on North, you know, our North Carolina coast, you, you have to go miles offshore to get water past 90, 100 feet. Within a quarter mile of shore, you're at 1,000 feet of water in Curacao, so it drops off very abruptly. Part, this is part of the uh, equation for the water temperature stability. There's also a lot of upwelling, so there's a lot of nutrients. Uh, but without any sort of associated blue problems we run into on the eastern seaboard or you know, on the Gulf Coast. So they constructed a facility here at the Curacao Sea Aquarium. You can see the aquarium itself is located right on a reef flat. Where you see the dark blue around here, this is 90 to 180. And that is literally 50 yards from shore. So it drops off really, really quickly. Anywhere that you have shallows and a flat is where we're running into our big prominent acropolis reefs. And this is why this site was chosen, because this is probably one of the top five healthiest acropolis reefs on the island. Um, it's still one of the few that spawns regularly with large consistent volume um, year after year, unless there's really anything detrimental. We had a tropical storm like four years ago and everything sort of splits on some coral spawn like two days early, some two days late. Uh, myself and the science director from Parmavi actually went diving in the middle of it just to see what would happen. And probably one of the scariest dives I've been on in my life because it was about 9.30 at night and like it broke <laughs> waves over the reef. And we went out through a channel. It's like being in a washing machine in the dark. Um, there were times that we, we had to call it off and float out and actually come back in this channel this way because all of our exit points were more or less turned you into a meat grinder. It was, uh, we, we would have been coral and reef fish food if we had tried to come out anywhere through here. So the facility before actually had like a cactus garden in the middle. They constructed a series of uh, different aquaria. The whole thing was actually made with a particular Holland that allows a certain fraction of UV light in so they still get natural immunity. Uh, so one of the problems we run into is if you grow them without you grow juvenile corals without UV light and stick them out on the reef, they just get to, it doesn't do them any good at all because they haven't built up their natural photochemical guarding mechanism yet. So uh, it allows a certain fraction of UV light in plus uh, almost full street sunlight. It's about 10% less bright than a uh, little straight sun, but because they're such shallow volumes, we needed that. So here you can see everybody in operation. Um, they have some of the rudimentary beginning tents. Uh, we started out the original tents that we used because the reproductive packets float uh, were about yay size, about the size of a, twice the size of a regular road cone. And we've moved to the point now that if we're doing a full colony, we have some that are like the size of a small pop-up tent. Um, and it's just simply like a cheesecloth. We put it at the top of float. You can't really see it that well on this one. And then we're using 60 milliliter Falcon tubes. So all of the egg sperm bundles will float up into these things. We can seal them off underwater, bring them back to the lab. And then in that process, we do the cross-fertilization. And what you're seeing here is we're actually tending this is the original method. 
Um, and that's the cool thing about c is it's an ongoing experiment. Uh, the things that we did the first year, we don't do 80% of those anymore because we've re refined and evolved our methods. Uh, these Chrysler's were actually designed by uh, Mark Schick at the Shedd Aquarium. It's run by a water pump that runs small spray nozzles to keep the uh, egg packets and the larvae themselves from sticking to the sides because they're still it's essentially a single cell layer and they're very, uh, they're very subject to shear resistance. We've actually gone from this to uh, reusable sterilite uh, plastic trays because the water volume in it is large enough that there's plenty of oxygen exchange but it's still shallow enough that there's enough gas exchange that it doesn't become a noxy. And they're way easier to keep clean, they're reusable year after year, so we bought one set of 100 and they've been using pretty much the same set for the last four years now. So, uh, as opposed to year after year having to make new stuff, uh, reducing the plastic load has been a big part of the project as well. Uh, you can see here, then with some of the containers, what they're doing here is they're using a UV blue light or a 420 nanometer, very similar to all of the nice ones that we use to make everything shiny. Uh, and a polarized filter so that we can see the fluorescence after the larvae. So a lot of larvae already have zoosanthellae within them, and this is one of the ways that we can track their development and their eventual stage to settlement. Wake up. We're not done yet. So, a big part of this is restoration. And this, what you're seeing here, we're doing out plants. We originally hung, suspended them on uh, what? what, what little Mercedes-Benz symbol tiles. After the first two years, the recruitment percentage was around 3%. Uh, we switched up to a 3D tile and the recruitment, like the long-term or at least yearly survival, went up to about 50%. So just getting them that extra inch or two off the bottom made a huge difference in their recovery. Uh, and we noticed as well that they like to adhere as much to vertical surfaces as they do to flat surfaces. So adding more uh, diverse 3D structure uh, improved the settlement rate and it also improved the survival. Um, outreach is a big part of it. I'm looking for really cool. Where's my guy? Uh, it's not in here. Because it's here. Uh, but we know the project works because two years ago, for the first time, we had a coral that we planted out that was captured from spawn back out on the reef, grew to be about the si about the size of half of this thing, and it spawned. And it actually produced viable larvae recruits that have then been outplanted back on the reef. So second generation sea core is actually in action right now. Um, the idea, again, I said it, the biggest problem is scale. Uh, and I don't have all my coral restoration foundation stuff on here either, because that's another great program that's done by fragmenting. And the biggest problem we run into is that we're able, to, for every acre of reef we're able to restore, we're losing 10 to 100. Um, so the biggest push now is to step up in scale. We've realized that fragmentation methodology works, captive settlement methodology works, outplanting, outplanting methods are getting better, and our survival rates are getting way better. So the idea now is how can we do this bigger and more effectively in more places? It's great to have a whole marine research facility to work with, but you don't always have that. A lot of times it's an island with a lot of lizards, a lot of sand, and some hermit crabs. You have to sort of be able to set up shop and make, do this effectively. The upside is that most coral larvae are very competent within a couple of days. And after the five year survivability study, there's a 19% survival rate for corals housed in the nursery for two days and there's a 21% survivability rate for three years. So we only lose a 2% difference if we just let them settle, plant them out. So we've removed a lot of the nursery phases, at least from the, I would say, mass production end of trying to do restoration. One of the biggest problems that we run into is just simply manpower. A single spawning can produce hundreds of millions of larvae that will settle out with maybe 10 to 20 on an individual tile that all have to be planted out by hand. It's a lot of hours underwater. I don't know how many of you guys are divers, but your, your clock is always ticking when you're underwater. And uh, I think Dirk's, rec Dirk's got the record for doing about 380 tiles in a single dive. 
which covered an area of about twice the size of where we're sitting right now. If that gives you any idea of this, the amount of scale and uh, effort that goes into these sorts of restoration efforts, it's amazing. The really cool part is that 10 years ago, there were about 15 people working on this. Now there's about five to 600 uh, different individuals, companies, organizations, dive operators, shell shareholders all around the world working on multiple projects. Uh, Secor is one of the biggest ones because it started out with uh, the one thing that most of these projects need, which is a lot of money. Uh, with the backing they have, they've got a lot of a lot of funding sources now, and as it's catching on. Uh, it's sort of like being the big first name to do something new. You tend to get all the attention, so they have gotten a lot of publicity and it's really helped efforts. Uh, this year they're going to hold workshops in 12 different places. Uh, Curacao, the Bahamas, Florida Keys, two different sites in Mexico, Belize, the Philippines, Singapore, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Southern Japan, and Guam, and then some pull out. Uh, so they're really doing these things all over the world, and this is just with Secor. You have other organizations like the Coral Restoration Foundation I don't need that, anymore. Uh, that are doing fragmentation, and a lot of that is just like what we do with an aquarium. You, we go out and we'll find a, an area of somewhat healthy yet degrading reef, select a handful of healthy adult colonies, fragment them up into small sections, and. Hey, they're actually the Coral Restoration Foundation's main method is they use mid work called midwater nursery trees. And I don't have my handy dandy shiny stuff to show you, but it looks like a really janky like uh, lollipop Christmas tree. But instead of having suckers and candy on it, it's actually covered with little coral fragments. Um, and we start out the average size is two to three inches, and then the average outplant size would be a diameter of six inches. So. They start out as little finger-sized sticks, grow to about a big grapefruit, and then we go out and plant them out on the reef, usually either using uh, two-part reef epoxy or simply just hammering nails into the reef and zip-tying them to that. Uh, with the push to get rid of less plastic, um, we're looking at alternatives. There's a company in Florida that's working on essentially a carbonate putty that would work like reef putty, but as opposed to being epoxy based, it would actually be based out of natural materials. So the idea is that you can concrete them to the reef with aragonite. Uh, I don't know how they're doing it because it's a really cool chemical thing and they're probably not going to tell anybody. So uh, that's just one of the ideas that's come out of this, that they're starting to become more and more novel products, not only for reef restoration, but we'll hopefully see in the aquarium trade soon. Um, I really ha wish I, I, I have like 90 slides of like really cool stuff that uh, are trapped in this little machine and I'm not getting out of them right now. Do um, you guys have any questions? Because I love talking about this stuff and I can go on for hours about all sorts of things. Yes. Yes, that's one of the things that is on there is uh, on Curacao, there's a water treatment, it's the, the desalination plant. Their effluent water is about two parts per thousand higher than normal, and the water temperature is about five degrees Fahrenheit warmer than average. So during the summer, it's 92 degrees in the outflow. And in just the 60 years that that facility has been there, there's been a die off of a lot of different species of brain corals, but there's been a lot of survivors too. And to the point that they're coming back, and most of those are actually producing stronger, more resilient larvae than the ones literally 200 yards downstream in the normal reef temperature. Uh, USGS is doing a study looking at sort of the reverse effect of where are places that coral should be doing badly and are doing well. Um, one of the biggest things that we've looked at with reef loss is if you think of it as a building on fire, we always look at the part of the building that's on fire and how to put that out, as opposed to why is everything else not on fire that should be. And when we start taking more, more different looks and more different approaches, we're starting to put together a more holistic restoration strategy that's based not just off of this one big concept of, we do this and it works here. Well, 
what works in each particular area, what works in each particular facility. And again, like some of the cool stuff I had is about some of the genetics work that's being done at uh, Nova Southeast. Um, and uh, Ileana Bombs was at Penn State and she's now, I don't remember where she moved to, but she was doing gene flow with survivability, looking at uh, as corals reproduce and survive and spawn, how they actually pass on genes to be more resilient to sedimentation, to nutrient problems, to being more resilient to temperature change, uh, even alkalinity shifts. There are areas in the lower keys and in the Bahamas that they're finding where you have very shallow lagoons and high pH shifts throughout the day and night cycle, that there are corals that are more resilient to that. And when you couple that with thermal stress, a lot of these corals don't bleach and a lot of them do survive and are the few stragglers that do reproduce. So the upside is that we're going to lose a lot of reef habitat, and unfortunately, in the next 20 years. But there's a lot of places that are going to survive and that are going actually coming back. Um, I had a really cool map that actually had pluses and minuses throughout the Caribbean of places that are, you're actually seeing reefs come back because of either, you know, multi-year gene resilience, bumper crops and spawn. The biggest problem is that every island system and even areas within an individual island can be different. So there is no big gold, you know, magic bullet that this is the fix for reef loss in all locations. And that's what's great about a lot of it is that it's not just a bunch of guys going out and breaking up corals and sticking them in the bottom anymore. That was a good idea and it was a good start, but now it's very, you, know, you have researchers, scientists, biochemists, there are pharmaceutical companies now getting interested because of the interactions between coral slime and the bacterial colonies that grow on those. Some of the byproducts of those are having some real, there's a lot of really interesting vitamin production and those kinds of things. So coral slime and the bacterial colonies associated with it may actually end up becoming something viable for pharmaceutical vitamin production. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, anytime you're taking a healthy, happy coral out of the wild and not putting pieces back, yeah, that's going to be a negative. But if you look at the gross overall, um, I, it's negligible. I mean, I've collected corals myself in areas where there are large, healthy patches that they're harvested sustainably, you don't see a difference. We actually had an area around the sea aquarium there that grew zoanthids extremely well. And we found, we actually did a, a harvested versus non-harvested. And the areas where we fragmented them, they grew even better. Because as we opened up patch space, then they were able to spread even more. Um, so, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a good thing, but it's not as deleterious as we're told a lot of times. Um, especially when you look at other things like industrial production. Uh, coastal development's one of the biggest things. When you put a, when you cut down all the mangroves in the coastal forest and put a, you know, a five-star resort right there, even if you don't touch the reef, reef itself, you've just changed how water flows to it. You've changed how sediment flows to it. You've changed how nutrients flow to it. And because a coral reef is a very tightly knit set of interactions, any major change in one of those influencing factors can drive the whole thing awry. Um, so. You know, I feel, you know you should feel bad, especially anything wild caught, but that's why stuff like this is so great. Sustainable aquaculture has really helped feed the science and research behind coral restoration. A lot of the biggest advancements now are being made, not just in field labs and, you know, field research facilities, but in zoos and aquariums. Uh, the really cool stuff, uh, and you guys should look this guy up, his name is Jamie Craggs. He works at the Horniman Museum in London of all places. But he, wore, he is the grand master right now of captive coral spawning. They have multiple colonies from multiple places in the world that are coordinated to spawn when they want them to spawn. Because all the corals spawn at night, naturally, you're usually up until about four in the morning doing all of your larval work. And they said, screw that. They clock shifted everything so that they spawned at about 9 a.m. 
you come in, oh, the corals are spawning, you do all of your lab work throughout the day, and by the time they're ready to go in settlement bins, it's five o'clock and you can go home. Somebody's gotta stay overnight and you know, keep an eye on everything. But the having to be up at five in the morning pipetting larvae from one spot to another, they have completely circumvented that just using uh, you know, indoor lab techniques, which is amazing. Um, yeah, photo shift. And corals photo shift very, very easily. You can, you can clock shift them to a couple of different regimes. So it's, uh, it's really cool what, what can be done and that so much is being done in captivity. A lot of this stuff is then the same things, you know, the techniques that are easier to develop in a lab, what works the best, easiest, and fastest is what you apply in the field. So we save a lot of field time by circumventing it with a lot of lab work, backing it up. Yeah, good one, man. Cool. Anybody else? Any anything you want to know about? Oh yeah, and actually, what I'm going to try to do, um, I'm going to give Grace uh, once I don't destroy this thing with a hammer. I'm going to send her a copy of my presentation, not only with everything that's in it, but with links to all of the really cool stuff. Um, if you guys like to follow people on like Twitter, Facebook, I have like a list of like 40 people that if you want to see cool stuff about like cor baby corals, reef restoration, like positive things going on with the ocean. Uh, you know, whenever you're having a crappy day, there's nothing like watching baby corals grow. So, uh, yeah. So hopefully after the uh, event, you'll be able to, it may take me a day or two to get it all to her, but you should be able to find it on the Sustainable Reef website and all of the links to all of these different programs and things like that, so. Ruby. Thank you, sorry for all of the technical failure and you just have to sit here and listen to me and hopefully I don't look too terrible. Yeah, no problem guys, thank you. Wow. Huh? Uh, 2011 I went from UN I moved from UNCW to Curacao, so.